John Milgram is the Director of Outreach for New York City's Department of Environmental Protection. He visited us at the Gilboa Museum on March 15th to bring us up to date on the restoration of the dam and work that will continue at the Overlook, the Intake House, and various release levels that will be used in the future. This is John's report. The other one, for that matter. Perfect. All right, again, thank you for inviting me. Um, here just to give you an explanation and hopefully a little bit of information that you might not know about some of the projects we've been working on up here, as well as some of the projects that we're going to be doing in the very near future. Um, I'm John Milgram, I'm Director of Outreach for the New York City Department of Environmental Protection. Uh, I cover the watershed from the Bronx to deposit. Uh, we're right now at the furthest northern reach of our watershed. Actually, some of the runoff of the mountain still goes a little further, but in terms of our infrastructure, this is the furthest north we get. We're about 120 miles from City Hall, City Hall in New York City. and. Uh, We've got some incredibly beautiful fresh snow uh, up here in, in Gilboa. Um, just so you know, I'm from Kingston. My main office is in Kingston. Um, I live in Kingston. Yeah, I've spent most of my life up in Ulster County, skiing Bel Air and stuff. Um, pretty much every, we've got about a thousand people in the watershed who work for DEP. Uh, everyone lives up here. It's all. Uh, local talent, local employees on uh, each part of the watersheds. Um, so that is just an overview of pretty much all the work we've been doing recently in by the spillway, right, in Gilboa, uh, separate from the Shandega Tunnel intake, which is just a couple of miles south of here. Uh, five phases of construction that we've had and are having and are about to have uh, which include uh, the, the low-level outlet, which is uh, uh, a unique phenomenon to this reservoir, and I'll explain that in a few minutes. Uh, the new East Overlook, which will be a public access area, parking, uh, seating, interpretive panels, discussion about the watershed, some discussion of the history of Gilboa, um, and a couple fossils, I understand, are also going to be there. And we expect that to be done fall of this year, we hope. Uh, another project we call CAT 212 internally, it's site restoration. That, and I'll explain a little more, that's about a $31 million project we're going to start in 2024, which is uh, essentially bringing the entire construction zone back to uh, um, hopefully a finished product looking where the sod is back, the rocks are back in place. We do some fortifying in Schoharie Creek where the new outlet channels are going to go. Um, quickly discuss the high-level outlet and uh, we'll have a couple of minutes, I hope, to do some Q&A. <coughs> I think I uh, showed this picture to a few of you earlier. Uh, I wanted to just respect some of the history and throw some shots in here that I thought you might find interesting. And I know obviously as a historical society you probably have every single one of these somewhere in the building, but uh, this is a view looking east. Uh, where kind of the spillway would be. Uh, this is the Spillway Creek, um, spillway dam here. The church steeple, which is an elevation above sea level. Everything we do is to sea level. All of our reservoirs are based off of sea level elevation because it is a gravity system, as you know. From here down to New York City, no pumps. It's all gravity fed. <coughs> the steeple is about five feet below of the surface flow of the current Swahiri Reservoir uh, is about the midpoint of the dam right now. Oops. A quick picture when it was first completed uh, in 1927. Um, five phases of construction that we've had. Uh, this might sound a little uh, repetitive and somebody, some of you are probably very familiar with many of these. Crest gates were back in 2012. Um, site work that we did back in 2011, uh, about $20 million worth of site work. Uh, reconstruction of the Globoa Dam 
uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with. Uh, finished August 2015, that was a $139 million project. Uh, the current big project on the docket is the Lolova outlet. Uh, you can see the valve chamber, kind of the uh, control room for that low level outlet, uh, just to the east of the spillway across the street. Um, that's a $142 million project. So while you don't see much of it above the ground, the uh, underground works are fairly phenomenal, and I'll try to get into a little of that. Um, the rehabilitation of Shandaken Tunnel Inlet Intake Chamber, which is, we call it STIC, S-T-I-C. <clears throat> it's a $48 million project. Work inside the shaft going down, as well as to the gates that open and close to allow the water to flow in. And uh, kind of new, fun, uh, unique, variable intake pipe that was installed. And we can't find one that was done previously at any other reservoir in any system. Um, Trying to find out if we're first, but uh, still trying to research that. And I think I just mentioned the site restoration, about 31 million, which will ultimately done, be done in 2027 is the target, November 27. That notice to proceed for that construction will be 2024. Uh, so it'll be two and a half, three years of just finalizing the site. So the low level outlet, this is Kind of the, again the, the the big project we're working on right now, um, and why uh, a lot of the heavy machinery is still up there. Uh, although I think we're we're pretty close. This is to be substantially complete this summer. Um, low level outlet is uh, you got the intake structure, which you can probably see if you look out to the reservoir. You'll see it sticking up, um, maybe a couple hundred yards offshore. Um, and behind the spillway, obviously. Uh, the gate shaft building, which is a cylindrical building, you can see the top maybe 15 feet of it, uh, just across, obviously, uh, 980V from the east end of the dam and spillway. <coughs> and then the downstream tunnel, um, which is uh, going down to the valve chamber at the, the very far end. Um, I do have some good pictures showing some of this machinery, which uh, we'll get to in just a moment. But a couple of items worth noting, these, uh, these two tunnels were bored with what we call micro tunnel boring machine. Micro because it's tiny, it's actually drilling a hole nine and a half feet big. Um, so again, you can imagine what a regular tunnel boring machine is. Uh, it's quite a bit bigger, we're actually Boring a tunnel in Westchester, I think it's 27 feet clear. Uh, so, but nine feet is still capable of carrying a tremendous amount of water. Um, the idea is to, with the gate shaft, obviously, you turn on the intake structure, the water that's already in there with pressure will rest the water out through here, hit the valve chamber where you can open it up and we will be able to empty the, well, theoretically, and this is unique to this reservoir. We have no other system like this on any of the other reservoirs where we could essentially empty the reservoir in less than a week, um, which is unheard of. So it has a capability. I think it's, uh, it's probably in the next slide and I'll explain some of the actual volume of water. Um, so the tunnel is uh, about 2,100 feet long, the tunnel one that we did, the two, the two legs of it. Uh, they were finished in 2018, 2019. Um, and uh, the gate shaft building, uh, I think they were about a month and a half ago, two months ago, they were painting some of the interior work areas and uh, trying to finalize the staircases and uh, some of these, all the interior rooms and that they're gonna have. Interesting, the control room in there um, is soundproofed. The amount of water when they turn on these valves uh, is uh, so extreme, pressure is so high that you won't be able to stand near the outlets uh, or even near the building of the outlets. And if you're in the building running the control chambers, we've got it all soundproofed. Um, and it's, uh, it's dramatic, it's going to be dramatic. Uh, progress, I think these are just details, the uh, installation of baffles. I think if you look down, I've got pictures of them already, that's already been done. Um, some of the staging area, we've got wind walls, that's all done. And the east overlook, um, 
which is the public access area near the spillway on the east side, right by 990B. We'll have some interpretive wall stone work that begins, uh, I think, it's supposed to begin this month. Um, we're shooting for the fall for the viewing platform area, uh, fingers crossed. Um, and that should look nice. We've got a nice rendering coming up. <coughs> we're, uh, <coughs> there is the, uh, the walkway. I think that's been installed. <coughs> um, but uh, some of that is going to come together fairly quickly now. Where did you say that's going to be? <coughs> Pardon me? Where did you say it's going to be? It's right off 9, 990B um, by, by the east end of the spillway, by the dam end. It's a public overlook of the parking lot. You can walk out with interpretive signs, benches, stoneworks, and fossils, and it'll be a view straight down the spillway, the stepped face of the dam. <coughs> anyway, the, the gate shaft, as I've described, you can see we'll have a better picture coming out. In this picture, here's, here's the dam, the spillway. Um, this is going to be the viewing area right here. It's 990V. This round circle is the gate shaft. You can see that 15 feet of it. Obviously, it goes down quite a bit further. Um, in reality, it goes down to the pipe at the bottom of the uh, the nine-foot pipe that comes in and goes back out. But those are gates. It's a shaft that goes down with the gates that can shut the water off, or you can open them and let it flow. That's what you can see now. If you drive by on 990V, I'm sure you've seen it. That is what goes all the way down. Yes. Oh, thank you. Oh, perfect. Is it all concrete? The face of it is, yes, and all the way down, absolutely. So are the tunnels, actually, at the bottom. The, the tunnels, I believe, maybe steel line. I'm not positive about that. The tunnel we just did under the Hudson we had to do steel lining between two layers of concrete. The amount of force and pressure is um, pretty, pretty extreme. And interestingly, we had to redo the tunnel under the Hudson. This is the main Delaware Aqueduct Tunnel. Back in the 40s and 50s, when they were building the original Delaware Aqueduct, they didn't line it all the way with steel because they were using steel for tanks and they ran out and couldn't find any steel. So right where the steel reinforcement ends is where the leaks and cracks started to appear. Down there under the Hudson, right at the shore, we're leaking about 30 million gallons a day. And this year we're going to attach the bypass tunnel that's already built and uh, plug the ends of that compromised section, decommission it, and the Delaware aqueduct did will you, now happen. Did you say 30 million gallons yes. a day? 35. 35. For 30 years. Well, at least 30 years. It was discovered 30 years ago. So, interestingly, though, it's been stable the whole time. It hasn't, the cracks, when we investigated it years ago, we sent a robot, a, kind of a, looked like a torpedo machine down. Um, again, you're 600 feet below ground, um, huge amount of pressure from the water. We've been down a few times since. It's, the leak doesn't get larger, it doesn't get smaller, it's just pretty stable. So um, something happened 30, 40 years ago, and it's just stayed like that, but it has to get decommissioned and replaced. And that's actually the largest capital repair project the DEP has ever undertaken. So that's that's a billion dollars. Um, I explained a few minutes ago about the uh, kind of the magnitude of the water through the low-level outlet. You've got the nine-foot tunnels from the uh, the gate shaft, and then at the valve chamber, which is uh, I believe we've got cone valves, but we might just have the gate valves. We have from from those nine foot tunnels, we have these two 78 inch lines. Um, there's also a 24 inch line, or bypass line on the side. Those two 78 inch lines together, uh, full bore. Uh, I, this is, uh, I'll, I'll give you a comparison in a second. 1.7 billion gallons a day can be shot through those. In New York City, our entire water supply on a daily basis is about 1 billion gallons. 
So in, we can almost, almost double, or you know, at least 70% over what we consume in the entire New York City market in water in one day with these two pipes right up here. This is the valve chamber, the outlet essentially of those two 78 inch pipes. The wind walls were fortifying some of the area because of the pressure of the water that comes out. You don't want it obviously to erode the shoreline um, and create more turbidity. And I explained this a little bit earlier. These are again, the two 78 inch pipes coming out. These baffles have been installed. That's to try to cut down the pressure and the, the not the volume, the volume is going to be the same, but to disperse some of the energy of the water as it comes out. And that, that's just a picture of the, that's, well, that's along the top of the, the spillway there in the dam. You can see the two, just for reference, you can see the two siphons. The valve chamber is over here. I'm sorry, the, uh, the gate shaft is over here. Valve chambers down right around here. Now back to the public overlook. I think you asked me about that. Again, we're looking at fall for completion. Um, this is going to be a public overlook. This is pretty much what you would have seen a month ago, a month and a half ago. Uh, we took some of the members of the county uh, um, legislature out there, some of the town officials from Gilboa. Uh, did a tour with them. Actually, I did this presentation with them, or we did the presentation with them yeah. when they were here. Uh, it will include a display on the water supply operation. And if you want, I did bring just these kind of one page fact sheets, some interesting facts about the entire water supply. Um, we're going to talk, uh, we'll have interpretive signage on watershed recreation, some little history of old Galoa. We'll have a sign on that. Um, that we're coordinating, obviously, with the Historical Society. Um, benches and viewing areas, and uh, a couple fossils, 380 million years old. Here's a rendering of what it's supposed to look like the nice stonework on the concrete that you see. Uh, some, some seating, obviously. And you can see, I think uh, you were asking about exactly where. This is the dam, this is the steps, the spillway there. So it's right at the edge of the dam. And it does have a, you can walk up and see the water spilling over or be right by the top of the spillway there. And 9, 990V, by the way, would be kind of right, right behind here. So the parking would be back in this area over here. Then back to the stick, again, the Shandaken Tunnel Intake Chamber, STIC Rehabilitation. Um, we've, uh, I'll just quickly go through this, but uh, we've replaced, uh, we're replacing the sluice gates, essentially the, the valves that uh, stop the water from going in. Uh, some of them that we replaced them with were, uh, had had problems and hadn't fit correctly. So we're still working on a few of those. Um, interestingly, and I think we saw a picture of this winch here at the top earlier at the very first slide. But the winch is there to operate what we call the high level intake adjustable, uh, some, some of us call it the articulating arm, which uh, essentially can go from, and again, we use elevation of sea level for all operations in all of the reservoirs. So from an elevation of 1125 at the top to 1080, which is a little further down, it's about 50 feet or so. So this, with the winch, you can actually change the depth of this pipe that will be the main intake for the Shandaken Tunnel. So you can chase cold water if we need to bring cold water down. And uh, water temperature obviously um, has a lot to do with recreation, fishing, uh, obviously on the streams and creeks. Uh, it's also indicative of usually good water quality, uh, the cold water and trout seem to love it. Although it's funny, other, other fish like warm water, and it, it depends on which area you are, but uh, up here, um, we will, and I, we'll get to this too, we're, we're also gonna have a high level uh, discharge system that uh, will bring water from the top of the reservoir into the Scoharie up to the, the uh, Nipa 
power station. So again, just a little more details of what I just went through um, and some dates. Uh, we did a dive inspection of the eight gates back in November. Uh, did identify leaks on gate number two. We've done that uh, man inspection of the downtake shaft. Uh, we've removed and repaired some of the sluice gates. Uh, we're gonna be working on that still. It's about a two month long project and uh, we're kind of in the middle of it still. And I wanted to throw this in. Last month, February, um, was uh, the, the 100 year anniversary of breaking through the Shandaken Tunnel, uh, which is when they first saw daylight down at the Sopus Creek. Um, this is uh, about a little less than a year before that when there was another breakthrough between two of the shafts. And this was a big deal, and had a really big deal at the time. Um, such a big deal that they had a, uh, they did a banquet down at the bottom. Everyone wore their Sunday best. Uh, they were lowered down the shaft 647 feet. Everyone worked on it, the chief engineer from the city, a lot of the workers. Actually, I saw another picture. Um, a lot of the sand hogs who were working on digging the tunnel uh, were treated that same day to a boxing match between a champion from Russia, a champion from Norway. Um, so it was a big celebration back then, but that is in the tunnel a little over 100 years ago, celebrating a milestone during the construction. And Jerry, we were talking about this earlier, the driving of the Model T through the tunnel by the chief engineer of uh, the water supply system, Jay Waldo Smith, who way back then was a big celebrity in New York City, uh, always in the newspapers. A lot of times there were some kind of snarky cartoons about him and his dreams for the water supply uh, and what he was doing. And I think there was a comment with this picture or near this picture or about the same time. Actually, it was a cartoon uh, making fun of Waldo Smith and uh, the uh, thirsty New York people who were hoping that the Shed Dakin Tunnel would sneakily get beer down to them during Prohibition. So, um, also, I, I'm sure you know this, but at the time when the Shandaken Tunnel was built, uh, when it first opened in 1923, it was the longest tunnel in the world. Hands down, longest tunnel in the world, 18 miles. Uh, DP, New York City, our watershed, still has the longest tunnel in the world, by a lot, uh, which is the Delaware Aqueduct. That's 85 miles long. And that's on probably about, it's between three and 600 feet below ground. Um, and it's, uh, Quite a bit longer than the next water tunnel. Obviously, there are train tunnels, road tunnels, um, and yeah, water tunnels. Uh, if you don't distinguish between them, it, Delaware Aqueduct is by far the longest tunnel in the world. Where does that terminate? I mean, from the city to where? To the Rondout uh, Reservoir. Oh, Rondout. Oh, which is right by Kermansen? Yeah. So. Then the next project, or one of the next projects, or two projects, are uh, site restoration, which is, as it sounds, uh, restoring the site. This is uh, in design phase right now. Um, notice to proceed for construction, we're anticipating February 2024. That's about a $31 million project. I think, as I mentioned, this is to bring the site back to um, you know, good condition with uh, fortified shorelines along the creek. Um, yeah, replant the grass in a lot of the areas and uh, smooth out a lot of the terrain. So that's uh, that's upcoming and that should be completed by November of 27. I explained this earlier too, I'll go through it again quickly. Um, we are working with the DEC to create something up here called the Seasonal Storage Objective. It's Conditional Seasonal Storage Objective, CSSO. It's an acronym. We have way too many acronyms at the DEP. Uh, essentially, it's a, uh, the idea is to keep the reservoir at 90% capacity during part of the year, pretty much the winter months, from October to May, ramp it down slowly, ramp it back up um, in the summer months where the storms are less severe and snowpack is less going to do. This is the only reservoir we have in the Catskill system that isn't subject to a CSSO, to uh, keeping it at a 90% level. So 
uh, with blessing from DEC, we're going to endeavor to do that. Uh, I frankly, I was talking to uh, oh supervisor. Uh, ah, yeah, the current Go Blower Town supervisor. Um, apparently, there, this is well, not apparently. This is something that should give some some bit of comfort, knowing that there's additional flood attenuation by creating a void in the reservoir and keep maintaining it during those kind of high storm, cold weather months. Um, we do have a CSSO down in the show pen. We do for the reservoirs on the Delaware side of the system as well. So it would give consistency to all the reservoirs. Um, it adds to obviously spill mitigation and uh, again, consistency. But with the acronym, I think best to just think of creates a void, just lowers it to 90% instead of 100. Um, the other project, which will probably be a little less visible, but it's you'll be able to see it, is the uh, the high level outlet, which is another outlet aside from the low level outlet what we were talking about, which is the 1.7 billion gallons a day. This is much smaller, but it will allow a a, a release to the Schoharie Creek toward the Nipa power plant. Um, this is a Relatively speaking to some of the other projects, about 13 million, relatively small. Um, but I think you can kind of get an impression. The spillway would be up there. The intake for that tunnel, the tunnel will come out along the kind of step area on the spillway. Um, also, to be completed about the same time that the site restoration project will be done. And that is it. That is the end. So, I'm happy to entertain any questions, thoughts, or, and I hope I gave you something that you don't already know. I come up here, I expect a whole bunch of experts are like, well, no, what you don't know is what happened two days after that. Um, so, really, I hope I got to give you something that you didn't know. I have a question. Please. Under, under what circumstance would you want to drain the reservoir? Uh, pretty much an emergency. That would be the only circumstance. What, what sort of emergency? It wouldn't be, um, well, I, if if there's any potential of um, huge storms and potential dam failure, which we're so not close to. Basically, yeah. other than, than a catastrophic failure of the dam, there would be no reason to drain the No, no. I think um, using the draining just for illustrative purposes yeah. that it would be able to, we would never really need to. Probably the, um, if say, uh, uh, you know, a, a flood was impending, would they use that to, to lower, you know, head of the flood? No, would, typically operations uh, for flood attenuation or to get to, on the other reservoirs, to get that at 90%, um, we would normally use the stick, the Shandaken tunnel for that operation. This is not going to be a, uh, Again, this is this is massive. This is going to shoot water out like you haven't seen in your life, um, and it's not going to be just a general operating tool. Like a the stick is a general answer. operating tool that will um, divert water down to the surface. That's what we would use to keep the ninety percent void. Um, this is you can use it partially for that, obviously, but it's. Don't remember if, I, if you were here at the time of the, during the presentation, but it's going to be extraordinarily loud operating the low level outlet. At the, the chamber where they actually operated from is all soundproofed. Um, so it is a pretty dramatic it, piece of machinery. Basically, they're either open or shut, or do you have. No, you can adjust it. You can adjust it. So uh, I'm not sure about the fine tuning capabilities because they are super huge, but absolutely adjustable. The two outlets, one is, can generate electricity, yes? No. No, the that generating electricity is down at the night plant, plant. Those two 78-inch pipes, no. Do not have no, there's capacity. No, no there's no uh, turbine for a hydro. If, yeah. if you were to do economic, uh, agricultural <coughs> release, would you use that middle a, One. a normal release would be the high level release for any water supply to go to the Nipo plant or downstream. Right. That would be the high level release that you could see the opening on the steps. And the siphons are going bye bye. 
Ideally, yes. Yes, they are, they've been a beast to maintain. We've, every time there's a icing up or material that gets stuck in them, we're sending men out, women out to clean it up and fix them and get them operational again, unclog them. Uh, they just have, they're not, in terms of uh, reliability, 365 day a year, seven day a week, the low level outlet is far superior as well as the stick. Siphons are kind of a stopgap. Mm -hmm. We just put siphons in down at the Rondart Reservoir for the shutdown we're gonna have to do uh, to maintain that level during when we shut down the Delaware. We can give them ours. And we're gonna take them out. <laughs> sort of they're, they're in and for a while they'll be taken out. So. You know, with all the searching for alternative power sources, why is it hydraulics? Involved. Good question. I've asked this uh, hundreds of times. We do we're talking we millions have, of gallons. I'm looking at all oh the yeah. reservoirs. These are in pretty well populated areas. I don't see we, why we right now reasons. have hydroelectric generation for about 35,000 homes in the watershed. So we do have a lot yeah. of hydroelectric generation. Some of them, you know, I was like, well, why not just put turbines in the tunnels going down to the city? because it, it really cuts down on the efficiency of the water flow. Mm -hmm. um, for example, right now we need, we're doing a test this coming week of the Catskill Aqueduct, which is the show can down to the city, a max flow test, uh, because that's going to be the primary water supply for the city while we do the Delaware project. We're shutting down Delaware, Catskill becomes it, aside from the approach system. Um, we spent about $200 million doing rehab on the Catskill Aqueduct and cleaning the film. There's a biofilm, kind of a, it's a, it, it's a scaly, it's inorganic, but it's a, it, it crusts onto the inside of the aqueduct. Um, I don't know how many tons, somewhere actually calculated it, but that reduced our efficiency of bringing water down by 15 to 20 percent. Um, so we've cleaned it, got all scale off. It was part of a huge project. We're now going to treat slightly with some chlorine dioxide down at the shell pan entry into the, to the uh, Catskill Aqueduct to keep biofilm from forming again. Um, so the hydroelectric plants do need a, a, a good rush of cotton. It can't be a, a turn off, turn on again system and the low level outlet is not going to be operated all the time by any stretch. So you need it to always have a very strong flow uh, to be a consistent generator of power, obviously. Um, and it can't hinder the flow that's necessary for the operations of the different reservoirs. Yeah. If that well, didn't from, go too far. From what I understand of the, <clears throat> the mine kill situation up here, you have two reservoirs. Water coming from one through a gen power generation plant, pumped down to the other, pumped back to the top. So it's a continuous system that's generating electricity. Yeah. They're pumping it back? I believe that's what uh, they're doing. That would, they yeah, can't be they're, doing that. During uh, low periods of electric use, okay. they pump it up. Okay. So it's a battery. It's an economic thing. They then pump it, it they comes pump down. It when it's cheap and they, Got it. they generate Got it when it's expensive. Oh, yes. I, I, yes. And there was a, it, there, there, it mm -hmm. doesn't make sense, but it does. Yeah. Yeah, that's playing the margins. It's kind of like Wall Street, I guess. <laughs> they call it a pump storage unit. Yep, yep. I do recall that. There was a company wanting to do something like that at the Ashokan. Um, but yes, I do remember that technology. So, In terms of the overlook, how many parking slots are you going to have? Is it going to be a good size thing? Mm, or? I don't I think it'll be a fairly... Good size. I, I'll have to get back to you on yeah. the I'm not sure when I was there. And give or take 20 feet or 50 feet, it's in give or take the same space as the old overlook. Yes. yes. And have you driven by? You can see it pretty clearly. Right? Yeah, yeah, but I was thinking it was on a two story thing. Mm -hmm. It seemed like on the other side of the road. It's on the, <clears throat> if you're heading south, it's on the right. It's closer to the okay. at the dam. So you'll be able to walk up to the railing and you'll overlook okay. the flow coming down the spillway. 
Smith was the engineer. Whose idea was it originally though? Mine, no, I'm joking. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I don't know. I've, I've been doing so much research on the water supply, um, the building of the show came, who came up, trying to find good details on who came up with the two basin idea for the turbidity settling, just brilliant stuff. Whether, whether Smith was there at the very beginning and how much he actually designed versus some of the others, um, I don't know if there's a specific single individual, but there were two. There was Smith and one other engineer, who kind of the notorious two engineers. So, and that was, they probably were around for the original design, because it, it all happened within 20 years, it's a, when they realized they had to go north from the growth system. So you tell us the drinking level. Uh, I've seen the dam, it looks like chocolate milk in the spring, and it's wilding, it's been raining. Mm -hmm. They suck that down through the tube, down the show can, and down, mm -hmm. and on, down, on, down, on, down. The mud must go, that wilding water must go all the way to the city, don't it? It can, I mean, it can. Um, <laughs> it's, frankly, think of this as almost four settling basins. Uh, the well, Schoharie has a chance to settle. Correct. Okay. okay. So the Schoharie can settle some. Right. Um, and remember, this I mean, that turbidity is, is this iron rich clay silt yeah. that was left over from the glaciers 15, 20,000 years ago. It's in every tributary. Oh. Um, it comes, it's also in the reservoirs proper. But you have a storm and any rain coming down knocks a few rocks. Go into, go into a tributary, walk into a creek in yeah. summer. You know, if you just kick, yeah. you make turbidity, you make yeah. a cloud of chocolate milk. Um, and storm will just knock the crap out of the straw lines. And Do they filter it. it when it gets to the city before people no, drink it? No, it's unfiltered. It actually settles enough. The west basin of the Shokan, which is closer yeah. to here, uh, that can look like chocolate milk as well. Yeah. And that will seep over to the east basin. Uh, we try to keep the level of that a little lower uh, so that it doesn't. And from the, in the show can, interestingly, we can draw for either for a release down the lower surface or for diversion to the city supply, we can draw from various levels. Similar to stick, but actually three levels. So from low level, middle level, high level, wherever the quality is best, where the turbidity is least, so that we can actually send out less do, turbid. Do the people of New York City realize how much is involved? getting in the water? I hope so. Yes. I hope so. We, we post so much on Smarter Twitter person. and Facebook on and online. Yeah. No, no, most of no. If you turn your water on, I can go right? I, I remember going down to the city one time, uh, when I was in my teens, and they rationed the water. You didn't get water at the restaurant. That was so civil war. Right? Yeah, you got that right. <laughs> or a glass of water. That's me. And I thought, gee whiz, how about that? In the 70s, there was a water shortage, and they kept saying, you know, shower with a friend. Yeah. <laughs> sure, that was in the 60s. Nice <laughs> yeah. 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 You know, no, we necessarily need to water. Water. <laughs> yeah. We've actually had about a 40%, 50% reduction in water use since, yeah, since the 80s. We used to be on average 1.6 billion gallons a day for the entire water supply. We're now doing it down to, well, on average, between like 0.98. I mean, one point. No, how is that? Through, through what? Through, through a, a bunch of conservation efforts, conservation. shower heads. Remember all the things that Trump was complaining about? Yes. Yeah, that's why. Um, shower heads. We, uh, when I was growing up, you would see hydrants in the summer. I've just, seen the uh, pictures. Yeah. 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 So they, they did low flow yeah. things for the hydrants, um, metering all the yeah. customers. Is there all metering you see seen now? Yes. Right. right. Yeah. Right. So, uh, are they all metered in the city? Or? It is yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Either, so either their building is a whole or the individual homes. Because it's metered. So, so your apartment building would so lower it to what? Does it pay to buy land? Yes. Yeah. Yes. yes. Although the policy has shifted a little bit. The FAD was just, you know, the FAD, you're familiar with the filtration avoidance determination? That's the, uh, it's essentially the, uh, the gospel from the DEP. 
It's the originally came from the EPA. It is the document, it's the um, order that we operate under to be able to provide unfiltered water. Um, so everything's in the FAD, including the requirement for land acquisition protection of the watershed. All the watershed protection programs are outlined. Um, the extents that the DP has to go to to be able to continue operating without filtering the water. And the estimate right now, if we had to build a filter plant, uh, would be by far the biggest capital project the city has ever undertaken. About $25 billion. Oh. Um, huge amount of property uh, that it would take. It's huge amount of years years ago, it's cheaper. <laughs> well, yeah, everything was cheaper. Yeah. <laughs> everything. So, so what, did, <laughs> what did they change about their acquisition? Well, um, to focus more, and I'm trying to remember exactly, we had a, the, um, oh, the Science Advisory Board, uh, it's a national group, it's slipping my mind, uh, they, they always review the different FAD operations, and uh, they were looking to target it a little more towards um, more, to not just get land anywhere in the watershed to really target more vulnerable or the more uh, you know, the pieces that are much more sensitive to potential so, solutions. So that is changing. I mean, the reason I'm asking it is, is and we little sliver in Collinsville that's owned by the DEP, and it's just why. <laughs> what what interest does DEP have in this particular you know abandoned farm as opposed to any other piece of property? Over the years, the process with the WPP program has done uh, water shift production. Um, it was always, you know, has to be willing seller, obviously. So if there was a call, and this could have been years ago, we will buy anything in this area. Um, nobody was willing, except this one guy with the sliver, and it was landlocked, and guess what? So that's what that's what we ended up with. Um, so yes, there are some of the oddities of that. So how does buying the property avoid you having to build a filtration system? It protects the watershed. It Protect. We pay taxes on all the property that we buy, um, but we can limit the, um, well, we can do work to um, increase the efficacy of some of the stream work we've done and some of the work we've done farms. Uh, we can also uh, reduce uh, potential polluting development on some of the property that's sensitive to, to the, the reservoirs. The DEP also funds septic systems in various towns and watershed. It was all the towns and the watershed. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, well, not the town of Joe Pope, probably not the seven. Yeah. Just that's it. Yeah. Right. They're, they're, all, comes they're, they're all closed systems, though. Yeah. It's not leaching into the surrounding soils. It's a contained system oh, that yeah. needs to be pumped. There are some septic systems that are perforated rings that will allow for the water that's in your cesspool to no, but I'm talking soil. about towns, good-sized towns, will have a city or town-wide septic system with um, primary yeah, and treatment secondary plant. treatment plants, mm -hmm. etc. Uh, and they're still doing a little bit of that. Uh, no, we're not as much as they did. Plants and we had a few of them. Yeah. Um, some of them are in need of repair at this point. Um, so the, the upkeep is constant. Yeah. Do they ever go in and actually, the silt comes down. I used to swim in a pool that had a lot of geese. And it's very much like that silt that you could vacuum it out somehow? Um, frankly, we don't have to worry about any of that settlement for like 5,000 years. Oh, okay. It's that it would take that long to build up to a point where we'd have to start dredging something. Right. Or 10 so, geese, whichever comes quick. <laughs> <laughs> no, we don't like geese. Geese are not uh, helpful to the water supply. Mm -hmm. They absolutely aren't. And anything that comes from a geese and a geese and floats a lot. Okay. So if it settles, it settles, and that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the New York City water, it isn't filtered, but it is chlorine. Yeah, no, there's uh, several layers of treatment when it gets closer to so down at Kensico, 
all of the Casco water goes to the Casco Reservoir first. Um, actually, we can bypass they actually it. Chlorinate the whole Casco? No, no. We chlorinate the water from the Casco when it enters the tunnel heading okay. toward the city. Okay. Uh, then we rechlorinate it at the Hillview and we give it a booster dose, which is a kind of a balancing basin. It's one billion gallons right next to the throughway uh -huh. uh, in Yonkers. Um, so there's little additional chlorine there. We do orthophosphate addition, which uh, coats residential pipes to help from lead and copper from leaching into the water supplies and uh, fluoride. And then uh, right after Kensico, after we do the main chlorine treatment is the largest UV plant, uh, ultraviolet disinfectant plant in the world uh, at Eastview, about two miles from Kensico. So all the city supply that's not filtered, <coughs> excuse me, goes through the ultraviolet disinfectant process. <coughs> excuse me. New York City for the bill for Pardon me? New York City put the bill for all of it? For all of it, yeah. It's all, well, it, yes, it's, it, these are all city assets. Um, water rates cover a lot of it, obviously, and uh, there's a board of water supply, which is kind of the authority over the funding and the financing. Uh, these are, I think, in the next 10 years, we've got about a $30 billion capital program. It's uh, it's interesting, the $12 million projects to me, mm -hmm. everything's going here, going there. But, uh, yeah, it's uh, pretty tremendous. So, yes. I can uh, somebody better recalibrate their uh, sediment, uh, uh, whatever you call estimates there. Back in the 70s, they drained the dam down, so it was just a creek going right down through the middle. There was so much sediment against that damn wall when the water was low, you could see it up against the wall. It was only down about 20 feet from the top and there was brush growing there and weeds. They made a road to go down around the dam in there and they were loading that in dump trucks and hauling it out of there. They worked one whole summer. Oh. Because the old intake, there was underneath the wall, there's this hollow thing and there was gates down there. It had completely covered them. There was no way they could let water out from under that dam. And I, and I saw this from my own eyes. This, the dam here? This one, this one yeah. right here. It was, built, it was built in the 20s and they had sediment like that in the 70s. They had to go in there and take it out with loaders and dump trucks. Okay, because I'm so that, that I'm thinking of the Kensico, which is a lot further down. Yeah, well, this up is a lot shorter yeah. estimate than the, I can't remember the figure you just gave me, but that's how long it took this one to fill up almost to the top. And they had to go in there and literally <laughs> dig and haul it out of there. I never took pictures with a camera, but I saw it was a lip drag when I was going to. The, went by it every day. No, what year was that? 77. 70s? If you check, the, check their records. Yeah, I'm going to see if we have pictures of the, There was a low level in there that they never mm -hmm. bothered to check or open it up or whatever, and, and then all of a sudden it was solid. Yeah. But it looked like yeah. before they built it, there was just a little creek going down that valley all the way to Bradshaw, all, all up to the falls. Uh, you know, it was like I say, and grass grew on the sides, and it was. You could see the old black top of well, Macadam, then the road. You could see foundations uh, oh, from wow. the old town. Yeah. I got pictures. I went down and took pictures. I mean, it wasn't a federal fence then. I mean, I wasn't blue nothing. But I got pictures of sidewalks and chimneys they tipped over and foundations.